We find ourselves this morning in Mark chapter 6, starting in verse 1. So if you have your copy of God's Word, would you open with me to Mark chapter 6? We'll start in verse 1 and work our way through verse 13. You see the title of your outline, Jesus Rejected, and the 12th cent. If you have your little half sheet of paper, go ahead and pull it out. There's plenty of room there for you to write your notes and maybe where you're going to go eat after this. I'll always give you plenty of room because I know what's important, right? Make sure you're out of here on time. Figure out where you're going to go eat. Don't, come on, you know you do it sometimes. Put your grocery list down there and what you're going to do afterwards. But take the notes. There's some space in there for you to take the notes and then use the back of the sheet when you leave for all your other notes, all right? In Mark chapter 6, 1 through 13, let's study this together. Let's dive in, see where the Lord takes us, and see if we can um, leave this place differently than when we came in. Jesus went away from there and came to his hometown of Nazareth, and his disciples were following him. And on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished, saying, where did this man get these things? What is this wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. And he could do no mighty work there except what he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went about among the villages and continued teaching. Now, verse 7, he called the 12 and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He charged them to take nothing for the journey except for a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not put on two tunics. And he said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And if any place will not receive you and they will not listen to you when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that they should people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick, and he healed them. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, help us. Oh, we come to your word here this morning. We don't want it to be simple words. We want it to be your limit, living, transformative word that, that pierces our hearts. And so, Lord, today, I, I pray that you would start first with me. As I proclaim your word, would you start, would you pierce and break my heart for what's on this text and in this text so that I leave the doors of this church different than when I came in this morning? I don't want to be the same. I want to be closer into your image. We want to be closer into your image, living and shining brighter as gospel lights in the places that you will call us to go. So Lord, would your word do just that now? We open ourselves, we open our hearts, we open our minds. And right now, Lord, would you take us? In your name we pray. Amen. So number one on your outline that you see is that Jesus marveled at the people's unbelief. Now in scripture, anytime you see Jesus marvel, uh, you never want him to marvel at your unbelief, right? That's not something that you want written in in the book of history, that Jesus would marvel at these people's unbelief. But that's the very thing that Jesus did in verse six. He marveled because of their unbelief. So Jesus was doing what is customary for him. Jesus was a teacher. Jesus taught. He would go from place to place, and he would teach the people. This was not uh, like college where you go away, and he would come back, and he's coming back to his hometown for the, for the summer. Now, Jesus is on a track, and he's walking, and he's teaching in different places, and he's come to his hometown as a part of his journey to teach. And he's done what is normal to go to the synagogue where they read scripture and then a teacher would give uh, exposition or he would talk about the scripture that was just proclaimed. And so Jesus has come back to his hometown and the people are astonished at what Jesus is saying. I mean, they're remembering that this is the carpenter's son here and they're, they're saying, where did this man get these things? What is this wisdom that's given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Obviously, the the word about what Jesus has done has gotten back to his hometown, that this carpenter's son, this, this boy who grew up in Nazareth, is now teaching with power and force. That there are, you've probably heard the stories of pigs going over a cliff into the sea. They've probably heard the stories of the lepers being healed, and not lepers, but the, the people with leprosy being healed, and the, the paralytics being healed. And instead of trusting and putting their faith in him, you see what they do. They took offense at him. They found him offensive. The Greek word here would mean that it's scandalous. They find it to be a scandal that Jesus has come in. 
And you see in, in verse uh, 3 here that they even give Jesus quite a slight. They say, is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary and brother of James and Joseph and the rest? That essentially they're saying, is this not the illegitimate son of Mary? Not recognizing Jesus' birth of a virgin, uh, Mary, they're saying this illegitimate boy. Where does he get this knowledge? Where does he get this wisdom to do such things? Who does he think he is? They think that he is out of his mind and they have taken offense at him. That Jesus, doing all these things, experiencing all these things, all the things that the people had seen, they're so close to him, yet they are offended by him. Again, at no point do they say that this stuff is wrong, that Jesus is teaching. They're simply astonished. And they simply cannot buy in to this Jesus. It takes us back to the past several weeks that we talked about the, uh, the anonymous bleeding woman, how the crowds were thronged in against Jesus and pressed so tightly, but there was the one who received healing because she had faith to trust in this Jesus, that we can be so close in proximity to Jesus without ever being changed by him, that Jesus is here in his own hometown, that people would know him, know his father and mother, know all about him, yet here he is teaching and proclaiming, <coughs> excuse me, and the people took offense at him rather than giving their lives to him. In verse number five, it said he could do no mighty work there. In Matthew, the gospel writer would say that Jesus did not, or he left without doing any work there. That The words he could not do any mighty work there, uh, meaning that the people's faith was so weak, they were marveling so strongly and their unbelief so heavy that Jesus could not and would not do any miraculous works there among the people. One commentator on this passage simply said, the greatest obstacle to faith is not the failure of God to act, but the unwillingness of the human heart to accept. See, the greatest obstacle to faith is not God's failure to act, but people, our unwillingness to respond, our unwillingness to open our hearts to this message. Jesus, marveling at the people's unbelief, simply moves on from their place. He heals a few people, lays a few hands on the sick, and he healed them. In verse 7, you see that he is leaving to go out and teach among the villages. And you come to number two, where we want to spend a, a crux of our passage, that Jesus sends the apostles two by two. Verse seven, and he called the 12 and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. Here, Jesus is going to send the apostles on mission. Now, it's interesting, and I want to take some time here to unpack this, that the disciples are being trained and taught by Jesus himself, preparing for their time to go out. I mean, look here in verse 1. He went out from them, and there came to his hometown, and who followed him? What does your text say? Who, who's with Jesus? But his disciples. His disciples are with Jesus as they're going into his hometown. The disciples are going to watch as Jesus is chastised in his own hometown and, and told to leave. They've seen him as he's walked with legion and healed this man of incredible disease and sent the demons into the pigs over the cliff. The apostles have been there in that boat as the storms raged and they begin to say, Jesus, what's going on? Do you want to see us perish? They've watched as Jesus said, peace be still, and the storms calmed immediately. The disciples have been there as Jesus taught about the parables and, and sit in that side room with them and just talk about what this means and exactly what he's talking about. The disciples have been with him through every course of his ministry to this point to where the disciples are now ready to be sent out. When Jesus said in Mark chapter 1, verse 17, that I will make you fishers of men. This is precisely what he's been doing. Jesus has been preparing the disciples to be ready to go out, showing them, training them, preparing them for these scenes, letting them watch him, letting them be a part of the ministry with him. The disciples have been training for this moment when Jesus would say, it's time for you to be sent. And can I tell you that those that Jesus calls, he sends. You and I are both called, but we are also called to be sent. The disciples were never meant to come and just sit at Jesus' feet for year after year after year after year to watch all that he was doing and take in all the knowledge and say, isn't this guy great? They were called to walk with him so that he could ultimately send them out on mission to go and proclaim the good news message of the gospel far and wide to see and tell all that Jesus had done. So Jesus had been training intentionally these men to go out the very thing that we are called to do as well. 
Friends, for years and years, I, I know myself, we, we come in and we listen. We sit at the feet listening to teaching, listening to Jesus' word, doing Bible studies, hearing sermons, filling our hearts and preparing for the moment every Sunday morning where you are sent out these doors. We can't stay here, right? I mean, at some point, we got to eat. I mean, that's why you have your list, right? You're figuring out where you're eating, right? We've we got we to eat at some point. You've got to leave at some point. We've got we to gotta walk out the doors and go into the world. At some point, we've got to leave this beautiful assembly of people where we proclaim and we sing and we, we re-engage. We have to leave this point and leave here and go out on mission. And so we take all that we learn, we take all that we've digested from our Bible fellowship classes, all that we learn in our small groups, all that we learn in our daily quiet times, we take all of that that we're learning from Jesus and we're sent. Friends, we've got to know that Jesus is sending his apostles out two by two, that he's been training them for this. He's been showing them and preparing him the way. And some of us in this room have been training and preparing year after year, week after week, but we don't recognize the great task that we have, the great calling that we have, that we are sent out weekly, daily, sent out with the gospel message. And if we neglect that portion of our calling, we are neglecting a big part of our life as a believer, that we are called by God, that he has saved us, he has redeemed us, he has made us whole, he has made us new, he has changed us and made us alive together with Christ, but he has sent us, he has charged us with a calling to go and make disciples of all nations from your neighborhoods to the nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We are called with this gospel message to be sent. Do we recognize it? Do we understand the great calling that is in our hearts? That we've been sitting at the feet of Jesus, learning week in and week out, digesting his truth and his word, but we have a calling to take it with us. There's great urgency outside the walls of this church. People desperately need Jesus. And so as Jesus is preparing, as he is making them fishers of men, there comes a point where it is time to send his disciples out. Now, were they perfect? No. Were they perfectly ready for this task? Did they pass all the tests with flying colors? Well, you saw on the boat, they didn't seem to have all the faith that they needed. In other gospel stories, you see that at times they may not have understood everything, but it's time for them to be sent out. Jesus has prepared them. He showed them, and he sends them out with authority. And, and let me just give a, a, a quick side note. Because I know that we have a, a lot of parents in this room and you are raising and rearing young kids. Jesus has intentionally, with intentionality, trained and taught his disciples. They've watched him. They've watched him engage in time to say, let's pull away and let's pray. They've watched as he spent time with his father. They've watched as he's taught the scriptures. They've watched as he's lived out the scriptures in front of them. But ultimately, there came a time where Jesus sent his disciples Hey, parents out there, there's going to come a time where my four-year-old, my two-year-old, and my one-year-old, they're going to be sent out from my household. They're going to be sent from my home out into the world, whether it's college or whether to get their own jobs or whether it is at some point to get married and go out. There's going to be a point that they're going to leave my tutelage and go. And so the question is, am I training up a new generation of disciples? Am I training up the next generation in my household? Am I intentionally training them, preparing them to be fishers of men? Am I intentionally walking with them? Are they seeing in their dad a man who loves and trusts in Jesus and has given his life to the Lord and see it both publicly and privately behind closed doors in our home that I love my kids to Jesus? Am I preparing them to be sent out? In your Bible fellowship classes, are you preparing one another for what's coming in the week ahead? Are you preparing one another, knowing that when you exit out the doors of 305 South Perry Street, you are exiting into your calling? And we can, friends, we can forsake it. We can say, this is it. I just come together, and I'm going to assemble together, and we're going to read our word, and that's going to be it. Or we can recognize that as Jesus calls, he sends. Do you know that today, the North American Mission Board, the International Mission Board, they are looking for the next generation of missionaries. They're looking for the next generation of people who will say, I'm a doctor, I'm a nurse, and I want to go live in this context where people don't know the Lord, and I want to give my life to sharing and showing the gospel in these different places. 
Maybe you're feeling the calling to go out in force on mission somewhere across the face of this planet. But there's also a calling right here in Montgomery to say, Lord, I'm going to give my life as a teacher in this school to, to love these kids in the way the Lord would and demonstrate the gospel by the way I carry myself and love my family and kids and the way I love the people around me and serve my church and serve the places around me. Friends, we're all called. Jesus has sent us out with the great commission to go and make disciples. So how are you being sent and how are you making disciples? And so there's a reason why Jesus sends these two by two. There's a reason why we don't go out alone, why Jesus doesn't take his 12 and say, hey, you 12 guys, y'all can go further together or you can go further apart. We can reach more people if you go alone. Jesus sends them two by two. There's a wonderful uh, missionary proverb that says, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. And so Jesus sends his apostles two by two to take this testimony of the good news with them. And so there's plenty of reasons, and here's just a few reasons why Jesus sends the two to encourage us as we go out and encourage us to not do this thing alone. First, testimony. The reason we're sending two is for a credible testimony. In Deuteronomy, that you see that when there are two people corroborating a story, it can be admitted in court that it's good for a credible testimony. And imagine for a moment the disciples as they're going out and sharing the good news message of the gospel, where they can say, hey, guys, y'all are not going to believe this. As they enter into a town, they can say, hey, I was on a boat one time. Don't you know the disciples could tell some good stories? I mean, think about what they've seen. You got the pig story. It's like, which one do we want to tell? You want to tell the, hey, you want to tell the pig story or you want to tell the boat story? You want to tell the leper story? You want to tell the paralytic? Which one do you all want to tell? I mean, they walk into these towns, they got stories to tell. And so they can come and say, hey, we were on this boat and the storm started raging around us. And Jesus stood up and said, peace be still. And I'm not even lying. Right in that moment, everything stopped and the, the, storm, the, the storm dissipated and the clouds went away and the boat was just still as could be. And the guy said, well, is that true? Yes, let me tell you another thing. And this happened and this happened. That they could come together and say, these things happened. We were there. We saw them. Everything that we saw, we saw it together. And they could compare stories and make sure everything was the same. It's a credible witness to have two brothers and sisters coming together and share together. So first, Jesus sent two by two as a credible testimony. But also for strength. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12 gives us this great word. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. Again, if two lie together, they keep warm, but how can one keep warm alone? And though a man may prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A threefold cord is not easily broken. As the two are sent, they can encourage one another. When one is down, they can pick the other one up. I told y'all several times about the time I ran a half marathon with Brittany, which is uh, by far the worst day of my entire adult life. Uh, horrible, horrible. But as we're running along, as, as I'm just wanting to give up, my body begins to hurt. All these muscles that I never know existed just begin to hurt. Brittany just says, keep going. You just keep running. Keep running. We're going to be all right. You're not going to die. Pick it up. You're going to be okay. Let's keep running. Keep running. You're going to be okay. I promise you, you will not die. You will make it. Let's keep going. Keep running the race. I would have been gone on like mile one and a half, if not for Brittany, to keep saying, let's keep going. Keep, I'm going to keep running with you. Let's keep, we're going to go together. We're going to keep, we got this. Let's pace it right. We're going to keep going. Keep pressing forward. And you know as well as I do, as we journey together through this uncharted territory of a daily walk that we don't know what's on the other side of it, we need those brothers and sisters around us who just say, keep running keep going, keep fighting, keep pressing in, keep going. And Jesus sends them two by two, knowing that there would be days of deep discouragement, deep uh, distress, there would be struggles, there would be temptations, and they need that brother to walk and run the race with you. This is why we set up this, uh, why the Lord has set up a beautiful thing called the church, called Bible fellowship classes, called accountability, called small groups, where you run the race with other people. There's an adage here at our church that we say often, we need Jesus and we need each other. Amen. We need each other as we walk through things. The disciples knew that they would face discouragement, places in which people would reject them and they would need those brothers to say, hey, I know they rejected us. Jesus said, shake the dust off and keep going. Let's keep going, keep running. Let's keep running this race. I know it feels discouraging. I know my one doesn't seem to give me the time of day. I know my one doesn't seem to make any progress, but let's keep pressing. Let's keep pushing on. There's strength when we're together. There's encouragement when we're together. 
See, this beautiful verse in Ecclesiastes reminds us why Jesus sent the disciples two by two. They're not alone in this task. They keep each other focused. They keep each other pointed on truth and say, hey, man, this is, this is crazy. The disciples say, remember all that we've seen. Remember what Jesus did. Remember what he's done for us. Remember all these incredible things. So I'd encourage you today, don't go it alone. Through this Christian walk, don't isolate yourself from other believers. In this day in which it has grown incredibly easy to watch church from home and not engage in Bible fellowship classes and, and be away and be apart, friends, it's so good to come together, to be with one another, to encourage one another in truth and in scripture and in song. So as much and as often as you can, gather with other believers, be together with each other, run the race with one another. Just this past week as I Heard the news about our brother, Wesley Robinson, passing and going home to be with the Lord. One of the last things that I got to see was his Sunday school class, going to his house, him sitting on that front, front porch, just sitting in his chair, and his Sunday school class singing songs to him, singing scripture to him, and encouraging him as he, takes his last, as he took his last few steps on this earth. Wesley and Evelyn lovingly did not do life alone. They encouraged every Wednesday night, giving tea to people when they came down for Wednesday night dinner, Encouraging people with a smile, loving on people, giving hugs and caring for people. And on their last leg of the journey, our church was there arm in arm to love and encourage them as they walked through the difficult valleys. Friends, we need Jesus and we desperately need each other as we walk through whatever the curveballs and speed bumps of life that get thrown at us. So Jesus sends the disciples out two by two and he gives them his authority. The same authority that we've been talking about all throughout the book of Mark, we see Jesus give them his authority to cast out demons and unclean spirits, but he charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money, to trust deeply in the Lord as they walked into these uncharted territories. Now, number three, you see Jesus say to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from it. And if any place will not receive you and will not listen to you, when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. Number three, Jesus recognizes the varied responses to this gospel message. I want to encourage you today because I know that at times it can get discouraging as you share, demonstrate, and love people. You want everybody to repent and come to faith and trust in Jesus? You know, at the front of my Bible here, I've got five names of people who have essentially been my one for a lot of years. I tell you, not one of them yet has come to know the Lord. And there are days when it gets mighty discouraging. You say, oh man, this is, this is just this is discouraging. I'm never going to... And here you see that there are varied responses, but that does not mean that we simply give up praying, give up going, give up sharing, give up telling, that we simply do not know how the Lord is working in a variety of ways. I mean, look at this for a moment. That to this point, as the disciples are sent out, Whenever you enter house, stay there until you depart. And he says, if, if they do not receive you, shake the dust from your sandals and, and keep going. And essentially, as the townspeople where Legion sent him away, Legion was sent back in to share and show the gospel. But Jesus recognizes these varied responses. Look in Mark chapter six through uh, chapter one through chapter six. You see who has accepted and who has rejected this gospel message so far. There's been the bleeding anonymous woman has accepted this gospel message. Jairus, the ruler of a synagogue with great worth and value in society standards, has accepted the gospel. A demon-possessed man named Legion went all in for Jesus. Unschooled fishermen, tax collectors, a paralytic, and a leper all went in for Jesus. All accepted this gospel message. Let's see who rejected. Legion's entire town. Jesus' hometown. The religious leaders. Jesus' family to this point seem to have rejected this gospel message. Now, there's no rhyme or reason, it seems, to who is accepted and who is rejected. It seems like there's no pattern. It's not just the rich are accepted. It's not just the poor that we simply do not know. But our calling is to share the gospel faithfully, and God saves the people. Friends, so when we get discouraged, Jesus recognizes the disciples are going to go out. They're going to be discouraged. There are going to be people who ask him to leave, people who ask him to stay because they're so engrossed in this gospel message. But our calling stays the same to keep going, keep sharing, keep telling. Don't get discouraged as you walk past your one and see that nothing has happened, no progress has been made. Keep pressing on, keep sharing the good news message of the gospel. 
the message stays the same. Verse 12, so they went out. The disciples went out and proclaimed that people should repent. Way back when, from John the Baptist saying, repent for the king is coming, to Jesus saying, repent, the king is coming, to the disciples going out saying, repent, the kingdom is at hand to today. The message stays the same, friends. Repent of your sins and come to Jesus. There is no hope for eternity apart from Jesus. So we continue proclaiming this good news message of the gospel that we simply need Jesus. Let's pray together. Lord, help us. This is our calling. We're called to be sent. You have called each one of us. You have made us alive together with Christ. It's by grace we have been saved. And so, Lord, because of the calling in our life, because of what you have done to transfer us from the kingdom of darkness to light, because you have made the dead alive, because you have taken this heart of stone and you have You've transformed it into your image. Lord, we're we're called now. You've called us to make this good news known to those around us, to those that you put on our pathway. And so I, I pray that we take all that we continue to learn, that we take the living word that you have given us. And Lord, I pray that we apply it as we leave this place, that people would see in us the gospel light shining brightly. Lord, we love you, and we thank you for Jesus. In his name we pray, amen.